Back in 2007, a competition was launched with the remarkable goal of establishing non-governmental exploration of the moon. Funded by Google and administered by the XPRIZE Foundation, this competition spawned the creation of numerous companies and collaborations, but there were no winners. On January 23, 2018, the XPRIZE Foundation announced, quote, no team would be able to make a launch attempt by the March 2018 deadline, end quote. While the competition has continued in many hearts, it hasn't had a cash prize for the past five years. Full disclosure, I did some contract work for the Google Lunar X Prize project, streaming Google Hangouts with a bunch of teams. Those videos are still on YouTube somewhere. In recent years, we've seen these teams continue to try and get to the moon. We've seen Space IL crash after a gyroscope failed during the braking procedure. We've seen the Hokuta team crash after their computer misread an altimeter as faulty and inadvertently hovered at five kilometers until the mission ran out of fuel and crashed. Each team has learned more, they've done more, and I firmly believe one day one of these teams will find its way to the surface and win the challenge. But it doesn't look like that day is going to occur soon. In the middle of the night, somewhere between January 7th and 8th, depending on your location, the United Launch Alliance successfully launched their first Vulcan rocket on their first attempt. Everything went perfectly, and they successfully deployed Astrobotics Peregrine Lander. Unfortunately, something appears to have gone wrong with the propellant system shortly after, and while the spacecraft is communicating with Earth, it now lacks the fuel needed to complete its lunar mission. This is your reminder that space is hard. We are so proud of this and all the other teams that continue to try and do something that has never been done before. We also commend NASA for helping make this possible with their Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, which is designed to help send small robots to the moon. As we've said before, and I'm sure we'll say again, we must dare mighty things. And failure is an option. We will keep learning. We will keep trying. And someday, we will succeed. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay, and this is Escape Velocity Space News. I am here to put science in your brain. Click subscribe, and let's learn all that is new in space and astronomy. Okay, hold on to your brains. Things are about to get dense around here. Our universe's most massive stars, those eight times larger than the sun and larger, don't exit this universe quietly. When they run out of material to burn for energy in their cores, they will suddenly collapse. And then that collapsing material will explode as a supernova. The largest of these large stars will either leave nothing behind but a nebula or will leave a black hole surrounded by a supernova remnant. I think nothing is a pretty straightforward concept and black holes are one of those things that no one can definitively explain the insides of. So let's move on to discuss what happens on the smaller side of this massive stars exploding story. These stars explode away their outer atmosphere and leave behind a core with a mass between 1.2 and 2.1 solar masses. And if they try to be larger or smaller, physics should, should simply say no. You see, these stars, neutron stars, are so dense that electrons and protons will combine into space-saving neutrons. 
and the star is supported by the neutrons pressing back like so many compressed springs. If you add mass, they will no longer be able to support themselves and will collapse into a black hole. If you could somehow remove mass, those neutrons would spring into a much larger white dwarf as the neutrons decay back into those electrons and protons with a side of neutrino and gamma ray light. These unique physics-defined stellar remnants are just plain weird. But they aren't so weird that students haven't been given homework to work out the maths that define their sizes. But it turns out generations of students and professors may have failed to take into account just how weird these objects can be. Lately, researchers have been finding stars that somehow are reaching masses as high as 2.35 solar masses. This reality has folks taking a new look at an old question. Can the cores of neutron stars be made of something even weirder than just neutrons? This even weirder material would open the door for more massive neutron stars by providing a new way to support bigger stars against collapsing into a black hole. Let's back up a bit. Neutrons are made of three quarks held together by gluons. According to team researchers, in the largest neutron stars, quote, their constituent quarks and gluons are liberated from their typical confinement and are allowed to move almost freely, end quote. This work appears in Nature and is led by Amelia Anala. According to co-author Hunas Horvian, quote, we had to use millions of CPU hours of supercomputer time to be able to compare our theoretical predictions to observations and to constrain the likelihood of quark matter cores, end quote. They find there is an 80 to 90% probability that the most massive neutron stars have a quark-filled core, and the larger the star, the larger the pocket of quark soup in its gooey center. These are super cool results. We now know there's very likely non-normal matter in otherwise normal looking objects. This is a cool new case of don't judge a book by its cover because that plain looking star just might have a core of exotic matter. Faculty, it's time to take neutron stars out of your homework sets, unless you're teaching computer science. One of the things I love about astronomy is there is always something weird and rare waiting to be discovered. Recently, the Atacama Large Submillimeter and Millimeter Array looked at a galaxy 12 billion light years away. Looking directly at the data, if you squint and tilt your head, you can make out a spiral pattern, sort of. Luckily, Software has the ability to look at more colors, integrate in motions, and piece together subtle features our brains often overlook. Putting all these pieces together, the spiral structure of the galaxy emerges. This system, cataloged as BRI 1335-0417, is the most distant known spiral galaxy. Analysis of this data is published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society with first author Takafuma Tsuki. According to Tsuki, quote, we were interested in how gas was moving into and throughout the galaxy. Gas is a key ingredient for forming stars and can give us important clues about how a galaxy is actually fueling its star formation, end quote. The team found the gas in this spiral is largely flattened with a bar in the center. But there are also unusual vertical oscillations. According to Tsuki, quote, the vertical oscillating motion of the disk is due to an external source, either from new gas streaming into the galaxy or by coming into contact with other smaller galaxies both possibilities would bombard the galaxy with new fuel for star formation." End quote. Bombard the galaxy and set up a cool wave that shows up 
in millimeter light. Spiral structures are rare in the early universe. And the more we find, the more chances we'll have to piece together exactly what's going on. This data set is just one really amazing snapshot in the galaxy's many billion year life. But this baby shot, while not very cute, is super informative. Astronomy is theoretically the study of how our universe formed, evolved, and will one day die. But to get answers for those high concept questions, we need to start by just seeing what's out there. What is the biggest? What is the smallest? What is the nearest? And what is the farthest? And what is everything in between? Cataloging everything is really where it all has to start. And sometimes, cataloging finds some pretty cool stuff. The Large Sized Telescope has installed their first telescope in the Canary Islands. And that telescope has detected gamma ray light coming from a distant galaxy. This indicates the galaxy's central supermassive black hole is actively feeding on a surrounding disk of material. This is only the tenth system detected giving off light at energies higher than ten at energies higher than 100 giga electron volts. And this is the most distant active galaxy ever found. And it was found while using this telescope while still being commissioned. So this is the telescope's first ever discovery. I can't wait to see what this cool new system is able to do when it's fully constructed. Up next, we take a deep dive into the Earth's magnetic field and some of the weirder ways scientists have to study how it has changed over time. Stay tuned. One of the great myths we learn from TV and books is you can take a compass and follow it to the North Pole. Folks, I'm here to tell you that if you take a compass and you follow its pointy little needle, it will take you to northern Canada, but not to the North Pole. You'll actually end up, if you have a boat, on Elzamir Island, wondering where Santa is hiding. The fact that the rotational North Pole of the Earth and the magnetic pole of the Earth don't align means that if you want to actually get to the Earth's rotational North Pole, the one the pole sticks out of on your globe, you have to look up corrections online and veer a little bit in, well, whatever direction the correction happens to be at the moment. If you're catching the show sometime far in the future, that Elzamir Island that is true in early 2024 is likely no longer true. I guess Santa has to move his workshop a lot. Anyways. Our world's magnetic field is driven by an internal dynamo that flows in different ways over time, and it responds to our sun's space weather. For reasons that we don't fully understand, our planet's magnetic field will even violently reverse itself. The timing of these changes is highly variable, and our current northern magnetic pole has remained stable for quite some time but we do see a bunch of changes reflected in the rocks. This makes one wonder, do we need to worry about our magnetic field doing something wild and potentially life-threatening? And the answer is, we just don't know, except for the life-threatening part. We're probably safe, probably. And to be honest, not knowing if, if it's gonna do something wild, this is why we do science. One of the coolest families of rocks, in my humble non-geologist opinion, is the family of those rocks that are fully to partially magnetized. There are lots of ways to make a rock magnetic. Heck, if you take a piece of iron and hit it with a hammer over and over, it will eventually align its atoms and turn into a magnet. You can also, as many a sewer has done, store a set of metal scissors with a magnet and the magnetic force from the magnet will 
slowly move the atoms in the scissors to make the scissors a magnet, a new magnet, perfect for picking up your pens. Natural magnets, things like lodestone and weakly magnetic lava and other iron-rich minerals, those, those actually have a pretty wild origin. Lodestone. It gets magnetized during lightning strikes, which doesn't tell us anything about Earth's history. It is just amazing. I would love it if you could leave a block of iron out in Minecraft and have it become a lodestone because that would be consistent with our awesome reality. Other magnetic rocks, like lava rock, contain atoms that align with the Earth's magnetic field while those rocks are forming. Over time, as volcanoes erupt, the various lava deposits will each align their iron with the Earth's magnetic field. Lava fields in Scotland, Antarctica, Oregon, and Australia all hold records of more or less detail that describe how the Earth's magnetic field has reversed, wandered, twisted, and otherwise altered over 200 million years. These lava flows preserve long-term records of large-scale changes, but getting more detailed records needs a different solution. The weak fields recorded in lava rock don't capture small changes and don't let us see moment to moment or even year to year changes. And dating is an issue. We don't exactly have written records stating the exact year and month different lava flows formed 780,000 years ago when the last flip occurred. This means we are trying to build up a long term history by saying, well, it looks like this volcano over here went off before this one half a world away. It's not ideal. If we want details about changes in the Earth's magnetic field, we have to look at human records. And here I actually mean human-made records, bricks that have writing on them, that locked in magnetic field records. It turns out your typical ancient brick or baked tablet contains magnetite. And this iron-rich mineral would melt in kilns and solidify with its iron atoms aligned with the Earth's magnetic field in proportion to the magnetic field's strength. In a recent paper in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences, researchers led by Matthew Howland examined 32 bricks from Mesopotamia that were baked between 3rd and 1st millennia before Common Era. Each brick was used to record various records that could be accurately dated to the reign of different kings. Since bricks can get moved around and aligned any which way, they can't be used to track changes to the alignment of the Earth's magnetic field. They can, however, be used to track the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. It turns out different places on our planet experience different strength magnetic fields from time to time. And from 1050 to 550 before Common Era, there was a spike in the Earth's magnetic field. Called the Levantine Iron Age Geomagnetic Anomaly, after the region in modern Israel and Jordan that was the Southern Levant region, this anomaly was a spike in magnetic strength. This spike is similar in strength to what we see in the modern South Atlantic anomaly. Just like we can, decade by decade, see the South Atlantic anomaly change in shape and intensity, these bricks reveal the Levantine Iron Age anomaly changed in strength. As a fan of archaeology, I hope future data will allow us to gather enough easy-to-date bricks to reveal the anomaly also changed in location. So if you want to understand Earth's magnetic field, go do archaeology. Oh, and modern brick buildings built over the last few hundred years lock away amazing data. And all those cornerstones with construction dates are going to make future study really interesting. Today, Earth's magnetic field is evolving in direction and strength. It is unclear if it is gearing up to make a flip, 
some research indicates past flips may be related to massive events such as impacts, interactions between continental plates, or the formation of new hotspots like we see in Iceland and Hawaii. Others believe these are spontaneous events driven by the dynamics inside our planet. Some say current behavior indicates a change is coming. Others say we're stable. Whatever the future may hold, we know that life has made it through past reversals. And life should make it through again. It just might get confused along the way. It's long been known that various critters, ranging from bugs to birds, use the Earth's magnetic field for navigation and migration. Now research in biology letters led by William Schneider indicates that migrating bats also rely on magnetic fields. I'm just going to read an excerpt from their paper to you. Quote, we exposed bats to either the natural magnetic field, a horizontally shifted field, or the same shifted field combined with a reversal of the natural value of inclination. We later released the bats and found that the takeoff orientation differed among all treatments. End quote. Put another way, they took bats put them in what amounted to magnetic field-filled boxes, changed the magnetic field they were experiencing, and looked to see how they lifted off into the sky based on those changes. And they found the bat's direction of initial flight was totally tied to what they were exposed to magnetically. I'm really hoping those bats didn't get too far before they realized their mistake. As a longtime fan of public transit, this has the feel of accidentally exiting onto the wrong street when coming out of a subway or train station. And I feel the, your frustration, bats. I feel your frustration. So, if our planet's magnetic field shuts down, a whole lot of life is going to find itself somewhat lost. But as we all know, life can always find a way. And in this case, it will find a way to find a way. Next up, I'm pleased to welcome on aerospace correspondent, Eric Mattis, for this week's Tales from the Launchpad. Hey, Eric. Hi, Pamela. I'm starting this rocket segment with the last launches of 2023. As we'll see, it's a mix of many different launchers that we saw in 2023. First up is the latest return to flight of Rocket Lab's Electron rocket following a failed launch a few months ago. Rocket Lab determined that the failure was caused by an electrical short in the second stage computer bay, shutting down the second stage engine moments after ignition. Let's watch the launch. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Lift off. Improvements for this flight included a continuous nitrogen purge of the engine bay to eliminate electrical arcing. This mission was called the Moon God Awakens, and it carried the fifth QPS SAR satellite for IQPS, a Japanese company. The launch was successful. Next up was NS-24, the return to flight of Blue Origin, the suborbital New Shepard rocket. Let's watch the launch. Four, command in star, two, one, zero. Ignition. We there have we ignition see. of our BE-3 engine. And liftoff. Mission Control confirms that New Shepard has cleared the tower and is headed to space. You can see on the lower left side of your screen that we're gaining speed. As New Shepard gains altitude, the atmosphere gets thinner. The graph on the left shows vehicle ascent. Now, we actually started at about 3,700 feet MSL. That's how far above mean sea level we are at launch site one. It reflew the payloads from NS-23, the previous flight that failed a minute into flight back in September 2022. All of those payloads survived the flight when the capsule aborted. This time, the flight was successful, 
carrying 30 payloads for NASA, different universities, and commercial customers. Firefly Aerospace launched the Fly the Lightning mission on December 20th. It was the fourth launch of the company's Alpha rocket. Like the previous Alpha launch, it was another rapid call-up launch demonstration. Sort of. This time, Firefly just had to reduce the amount of time to get the payload prepared for launch compared to their first demonstration, where they had to be ready to launch within 24 hours of call-up. Let's watch the launch. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The payload was Tantrum. A small satellite made by Lockheed Martin with a new antenna design. It was developed in a relatively short period of time, just 24 months, to demonstrate new processes in the company. Firefly was able to have a live stream for this flight fired up by NASA Spaceflight, who we normally associate with the Texas tank watchers. The launch countdown went smoothly, and the flight was nominal through to when coverage was ended at the request of the customer. Lockheed didn't say anything for hours after launch, making people concerned that the final part of launch had perhaps not been successful. However, the U.S. military finally posted the satellite's orbit. It was tracked in a 520 by 215 kilometer orbit instead of the planned circular 550 kilometer orbit. The apogee was within tolerances, but likely because the second stage either failed to restart or only operated for a second or two, something that's happened before on Alpha Flight 2. Tantrum only has small ion thrusters, so it will not be able to raise its orbit much, if at all, and will decay within weeks. Luckily, Lockheed Martin was planning to demonstrate rapid commissioning of the satellite and its sensor, so it's possible they would get some data before the satellite ranchers. In a press release posted to the company website, Firefly gave some information on the partial failure and apologized to Lockheed Martin, promising to provide updates as the failure investigation proceeds. SpaceX launched the second and third SARA satellites for the German government on December 24th. The launch was successful, completing the constellation. And we can watch a bit of that launch. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition, and lift off. Vehicle station down range. Stage one propulsion is nominal. We also had the launch of the OTV-7 mission on December 28th for the U.S. Space Force by SpaceX. Also called USS F-52, the mission featured the X-37B space plane flying on Falcon Heavy for the first time. Let's watch the launch. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, engine full power. And liftoff. The Space Force had stated the Falcon Heavy was needed to launch the X-37 into new orbital regimes, where it will experiment with future space domain awareness technologies and investigate radiation effects on materials provided by NASA, end quote. A vague description, typical of classified missions. And, as usual, for classified missions, no orbit was published. However, it can be inferred from the Space Force's public statements, previous postings of example rocket performance needed to bid on the mission, and airspace closers associated with launch, that it will have a very high apogee and be strongly inclined from the equator. We'll have to see if, or more likely when, amateur satellite trackers find it in orbit after launch. This mission featured reused boosters, each on their fifth flights, which returned all the way back to land and a brand new expendable core stage. As is typical for classified missions, coverage didn't show payload fairing separation, though the base force did publish a photo of the plane before encapsulation, and the live stream ended after booster landing. There were also eight Chinese, two Russian, and two batches of Starlink satellites set into orbit since our last show in 2023. One of the Starlink launchers is worth talking about. 
Starlink Launch 6-32 featured the record 19th flight of Booster 1058, the ones that sent Bob and Doug, the two guys after whom two of the SpaceX support ships on the East Coast are now named after, into orbit on board the Crew Dragon Demo-2 mission in 2020. This time, 1058 successfully launched 22 Starlink V-2 minis into orbit and landed on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. On the way back to Port Canaveral, however, it toppled over in rough seas due to an unevenly loaded leg collapsing. This also damaged one of SpaceX's two Octograbber automated recovery robots. SpaceX stated this happened because the booster had an old leg design that used non-self-leveling legs, an improvement that has been made to subsequent boosters. This outcome was unfortunate for this Raspberry storage booster, but hopefully they can put at least some of it on display in a museum, as it was the first Falcon 9 to carry humans to orbit. The other Starlink launch, 6-36, was completely nominal. On January 1st, the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, launched the ExpoSat on the PSLV C-58 mission. ExpoSat is ISRO's first space observatory for X-ray polarization. It uses a standard payload bus called IMS-2, which has been used for several previous scientific missions. Let's watch the launch. Three, four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off five, normal. Second. Bright morning of the New Year's Day Good made second. brighter by a majestic liftoff. PSLV C-58 carrying India's X-ray polarimetric satellite towards its destination. ExpoSat will stare into black holes, active galactic nuclei, and pulsars, some of the brightest objects in the universe. These all give off X-rays, and by studying the orientation of those rays, scientists hope to be able to discover how black holes and pulsars spin, and why active galactic nuclei have large jets in their centers. ExpoSat will do its work in coordination with NASA's XP, which was launched back in 2021. And finally, on January 3rd, from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral, SpaceX launched a small communication satellite called Ovzon 3 for mobile satellite communications company Ovzon, which has offices in Sweden and the US. Earlier that same day, they also launched a batch of Starlink satellites from Vandenberg Space Force Base on the West Coast. This is the first show of 2024, so we're pushing the reset button on our weekly launch statistics. However, before we do, let's quickly talk about the launches in 2023. According to Rocket Launch Live, there were 223 launches, of which eight were failures. The United States led the way with 108 launches, followed by China with 67. In terms of who was launching things in orbit in 2023, the top six launch providers were SpaceX with 97 launches, the Chinese government with 49, Roscosmos with 11, Rocket Lab with 9, and ISRO and the Russian military, each with eight. And even though we're only a few days into 2024 when we're recording this, there have been three launches so far, two by the United States and one by ISRO. Thanks, Eric. Before we go, I want to give you some good news about one of Earth's next big telescopes. 18 mirror segments are on a 10 thousand kilometer journey from optics manufacturer Saffron Rossic in France to the Atacama Desert. There, they will become part of the extremely large telescope. Ultimately, the ELT will have 133 mirror segments that work together to form a surface 39 meters in diameter. The technology behind this telescope is amazing, but the naming skill is Less so. I would really like to make a plea that we return to naming telescopes after mountaintops, funders, and amazing researchers. Currently we have the large size telescope, very large array, very long baseline array, very large telescope, square kilometer array, extremely large telescope, 30 meter telescope, and the now canceled, yet I did like this name overwhelmingly large telescope, or OWL. That one was good. At a certain point, we're going to run out of superlatives, and the younger generations are already mocking us. Here is my challenge to all of you astronomers on telescope planning committees. Can we please do better naming, please?
Anyways, that's all for now. Good night, everyone. And remember to go out and look up and click subscribe. Bye-bye. <laughs>